Welcome to the Burgess Foundation podcast special on John Keats and Anthony Burgess. My name is Martin Kratz and I'll be talking to Dr. David Miller about John Keats, Anthony Burgess and the posthumous lives of John Keats. Dr. David Miller is Senior Lecturer in the Department of English Literature at Manchester Metropolitan University. He's the General Editor of the Journal of Literature and Trauma Studies and he has a forthcoming monograph on Keats and the Poetics of Loss. Our conversation was recorded on the 19th of April 2016 and made possible by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, Manchester Metropolitan University and the International Anthony Burgess Foundation in Manchester. Before beginning our interview, here is a short introduction to Anthony Burgess and his relationship to John Keats. Burgess's earliest published description of Keats is from English Literature, a survey for students, written while Burgess was working as a teacher in Malaya in 1958. Burgess writes, Perhaps John Keats, had he lived beyond his mere 26 years, would have become one of the great poets of all time. So many, aware of his sensuous gift and flood of rich language, believe, thinking also that his letters show the beginnings of a mature and incisive intellect that might, given time, have tempered his lush romanticism to something like a Shakespearean quality. This passage sets up Burgess's prevailing opinion of Keats. Had Keats lived, he could have been a 19th century Shakespeare. In Abba Abba, his fictional biography of Keats, published in 1977, Burgess treats the poet's death with a kind of indignation that is proportionate to such a loss to literature. As Keats is angry and wants to live, he still has work to do. Burgess's portrayal of Keats has been criticised for various things, including by Roger Lewis that his Keats fails to be Keatsian. However, in many ways, the idea of what Keatsian is is exactly what Burgess's portrayal challenges. Burgess's frustrated poetic spirit is a counter-narrative to what the Keats biographer Eileen Ward describes as the myth of Adonais. I began our interview by asking Dr David Miller about his own research. I'm trying to write a longer uh, study of Keats, uh, looking at his uh, significance uh, and, and importance over and above the kind of categories that have become traditionally associated with Romanticism. There are some standard or there were some kind of standard concepts and ideas related to English Romanticism. And I wanted to work on Keats and position Keats within a different strand of poetic writing to do with different intensities and uh, different significances uh, to which I see Keats being, being attached uh, over and above these the, the, traditional, the traditional categories. Uh, not only that, but I wanted to apply to Keats um, some of the, of the kind of more philosophical and theoretically uh, advanced kind of categories and concepts from continental criticism that I feel Keats uh, uh, hasn't been subject to. So, in other words, if we look at the work of Friedrich Holderlin in Germany or Paul Celan, if we look at the work of Rilke, if we look at uh, Mallarmé or Rambo in France, uh, those poets have attracted really, really strong uh, philosophical minds and philosophical and critical readings by the likes of, you know, uh, Blanchot and Mallarmé. Uh, Heidegger writing on Holderlin and Rilke and and so on, and it always struck me that that that, that Keats could stand with those other poets in terms of the, the the value, the strength, the complexity, the power of his poetry. But yet we don't have any that I'm aware of uh, strong studies in in that same vein, in that same kind of hermeneutic and critical and philosophical vein. Does Keats does get put in specific sets, doesn't he? First yeah. of all, the Keats, the kind of the Hunt Keats circle, and then later as um, different sort of circles of romanticism. Um, the I, I'm interested in the way people try to then that, that it's kind of when revisiting Keats. Um, I guess 
reading Abba Abba, Burgess tries to do something new with him by putting, again, putting him with someone who he's not known to have encountered, or yeah. could have, which is which is Belly, this um, Italian poet, who's not Roman poet, who's not known here, but again, to kind of get a new Keats. Um, and I'm guessing it's sort of kind of the the challenge in Burgess's work, and it sounds sort of, that seems to be what I think sort of Keats is asking for quite often, is a revisiting of this notion of what Keatsian is. Um, I don't know if... I, th- I, think that's, I think that's significant, and I think that's right. I think Burgess is probably centering on that same area that interests me, which is, I don't think, it ties in with what I said earlier, I don't think we've fully come to terms with what Keats represents for English literature yet. I think we'll get. I think we're getting closer to it, but uh, there's something in Keats. There's something striking in Keats about his relationship to death, his own death, his own manner of dying. Uh, there's something in Keats in terms of his relationship to other poets of his time, but also of earlier times, his relationship to Spencer and Shakespeare, uh, and so on. That 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 uh, that we've not fully, I think, grasped yet. We've got good, very very good, excellent historical studies. We've got kind of straight down the line comparative studies, uh, and we've got some fairly good formal studies. But 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 the kind of study that would, in a sense, examine why we are still intrigued by Keats. What's the significant uh, significance of Keats to us now in our in our era? Not just for from the point of view of the study of English literature, but for us in our relationship to literature. Blanchot in the space of literature asks a question. He asks us. Uh, the, 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 the great writers, Kafka, Rilke, Mallarmé, for him, they're all continental writers, mm-hmm. he doesn't mention one English poet, um, they all pose a similar question. Why does literature still matter to us? Um, and I think Keats poses that question to us. His, his poetry does still matter to us, but we're not quite sure why still. I think Keats catches Burgess off guard. I don't think Keats was ever really on his radar in the same way that Shakespeare is, who he sort of obsessively returns to and, and kind of writes the biography about and writes a book about. And Keats, um, it's been fairly, it's been sort of variously argued that the Keats portion of the book Abba Abba was kind of written as a as a, a way of getting the belly translations published that actually Burgess is kind of sort of first love in this, in, in this, ah. um, in this project is belly. And then he sort of framed it in this, with this novella, which is a meeting between Keats and Belly. But I actually think what happens throughout that is that Keats surprises him. That, like you said, Keats still ha- has something to give, uh, or in fact, that we're not quite sure what that is. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm not sure Burgess reaches any necessarily any conclusions on exactly what that is. But he starts, he begins to work towards it. Yeah. I think that's absolutely right. I think Burgess is, is right in that sense, in the way you describe it, that Keats, the, the, the very presence of Keats, I mean, you know, if you read anthologies, you read Wikipedia entries, you read web page entries on Keats, it'll say he's one of the most, he's one of the best known English romantic poets, he's one of the most quoted, the most anthologised, and so on and so forth. But actually, the meaning, significance and power of the poetry is still still remains to be answered. It still poses that question to us. It kind of creeps up on us. And I think I think that I think the the fact that those questions still are important to us is because they're about important things. I think it's about death, uh, uh, our relationship to mortality, our relationship to poetic language, the the relationship of poetic language to death and and uh, uh, and decay and 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 disease uh, and the battle of life against you know uh, decay and so on. And it kind of cre- it creeps up on you. We think we know keys. And then somehow you're reading Keats, you read the letters, you read some of the, you read you read the poetry. You know, people generally go to the great the great odes, but then something happens, something creeps up on you about uh, 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 about Keats. It surprises us. That's what that's what happened with me. That's why that's why I'm trying to trying to write a book on on Keats. It kind of cre- it crept up on me. I never I never really expected to to to, to write a book on Keats, but it's kind of it surprised me, as you say. Um, and I think the thing is as well. There's a little anecdote about this. I, uh, you know, his grave is 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 in the the non the non-Catholic. They call it the Protestant cemetery, but it's the non-Catholic 
cemetery in Rome and I was actually in there and I wasn't actually looking for Keats's grave I was looking for Gramsci's grave at the time it was about 20, it was about 20 years ago and I was wandering around and I knew Keats's grave was in there but I wasn't specifically looking for it I was going to look for it later because I was looking for Gramsci's grave and of course I came across I came across his grave with the famous inscription there and and I, I've always, I kind of hold that in my mind of this idea of Keats kind of almost the spectre of Keats the ghost of Keats kind of emerging appearing before you to ask this question about why poetry still matters to us, why the figure of Keats still matters to us, much, much more in the nature of the work I'm doing than simply a historical study. I mean, we've got plenty of historical studies, but that, that doesn't quite explain why, why Keats still matters to us. And I'm sure Burgess is aiming at the same thing in Abba Abba. I wanted to talk a bit about Keats and death. Mm -hmm. And um, you were talking just before about Burgess being no, you were talking yourself about this idea of Keats. Well, kind of uh, Keats as a, as a. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm I'm losing the words for it, which is actually perhaps appropriate because I think I've got something here about how um, Burgess uh, came to sort of think about Keats, and it happens again and again that he sort of thinks about Keats as a a returning spirit, as a kind of spirit with unfinished business, and yeah. it's nothing um, much more articulate than than that but he he keeps sort of um bothering burgess but burgess kind of dramatizes a bit more in his um autobiography in the second part of his biography he talks about reciting the odes um either on the spanish steps or even in the apartment on the piazza di spagna where keats died for an event at the keats shelley house and the following happened reciting the odes i became aware of a kind of astral wind a malevolent chill of a soul chained to a place where the body died of a silent malignant laughter that mocked not my reading but the poems themselves and then later when he's filming with a crew for canadian television uh, again on the piazza di spagna he says i recited the last sonnet when i have fears that i may cease to be on the steps outside mm. Keats' house, it was high summer and the sky was cloudless, but within the space of 14 lines of iambic pentameter, a storm arose. The rain teemed, I and the television team were drenched, and the final couplet was drowned by thunder. The camera caught all of this. I'm not imputing a demonic vindictiveness to the soul of John Keats. It seemed to me rather a fierce creative energy, forbidden its total fulfilment by a premature physical death, frustrated mm. into destructiveness, was hovering around the house where he died. Fanciful, true, let it go, forget it. But the last one um, was, uh, this is possibly my favourite, uh, is later on when he was driving, I think driving back to Rome from uh, Monaco, he says, a French truck nudged us onto a soft shoulder on a secondary road, and the Renault, a very lightweight vehicle, went over and over and ended upside down in a ditch. We, that's him, uh, his wife Liana and their son Andrew, managed to unfasten seat belts before the car caught fire, though we would have been out of it more quickly had we not been wearing seat belts. I, like the fool I was, am, um, went on puffing at a shimmel penning. Andrew, cool and brave, got the luggage out. The car destroyed itself. How far this could be blamed on John Keats, I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> so he kind of, he, he, yeah, he obviously sort of <laughs> yeah. takes it somewhere else. But in his writing, it's very clear that um it's it's not it's a kind of counter balance to the pale flower um that Shelley portrays Keats as yeah. um uh, it's it's kind of a very vital Keats and still vital beyond death this kind of vital energy that sort of and this sense of unfinished business um yeah. that sort of comes across yeah i i, I the, the the other line that struck me in the line that you you quoted there was on ceasing to be and and uh, actually, I've got a chapter in the book that I'm working on on Keats called "On Ceasing to Be." Right. Um, and it seems to me that that's one of the questions that keeps hovering around Keats because of his posthumous, you know, the idea, the phrase of Keats, you know, when uh, when will I be rid of this posthumous existence? When will this posthumous existence end? This idea that he is sort of is he his he, his forceful bodily creaturely life, which which Burgess obviously grasps very very clearly is struggling against this encroaching non-being, this non-existence. And the, the question that emerges at that point is, what, what will Keats's existence be? 
after his after his demise, if his current existence while he's working and producing and struggling against his illness, this idea of Keats as a kind of pugnacious, tenacious, terrier-like courage that, that, that he's mentioned about, uh, that, that, that many people noticed about him during his life. It's mentioned in, in, the, in the school school notes about him and so on. Um, what will become of Keats after death? What will his, what will the posthumous posthumous existence be to us? Mm. Um, now we think it's, as I said, it's not merely a matter, a matter of literary history. There's a, there's a number of, there's a number of very kind of pressing questions that Keats's poetry and his writings, and I think the letters as well. I think that's one of the things I've come, I've realised in doing the work that I'm working on at the moment. I mean, it's traditional in the way I was trained to do literary to do the literary criticism was that you could largely discount letters but I'm looking at Keats's letters as a work of literature as a body of literature in themselves but it's, so it's clear from the letters it's clear from the poetry and the, the various other uh, prose fragments and so on and so forth that, that that Keats poses a series of questions to us that are still unanswered not just to do with the question of death and you know what the meaning of our life is because we don't know what the meaning of life is until it's over. It's always past tense. But for the writer, for a writer like Keats, it seems, you know, he dies into meaning. He, his life will gain meaning. He will join the English poets after his death. So it's not just what we might call an existential question that Keats poses. I think it's connected intrinsically and very intimately to the question of literary and poetic language. Some of the quotations that you read there are very, very interesting. It's clear that Burgess is engaging with what might, what we might call and what we probably would call the culture industry. You've got your TV crew. They're on the steps of the uh, uh, Spanish steps and so on at the Keats Shelley House there yeah. in Rome. There is what we might call the literary business. There is mm -hmm. the business of literary criticism. There is, there, is, there is academic criticism and so on and so forth. And that engages with and feeds on and works with poetry but it's not what poetry is. It's not what poetry asks of us. It's not the question that poetry poses to us. And I think what what you read there is that Burgess realizes that there are these, there is the culture industry, there is the literary world, and then there is this this other world. There are these spectres. Not let's not call them ghosts. I think I think spectres are, is probably the right word that constantly and persistently pose the question, an agonizing question actually about that a life committed to literature, and Burgess certain, Burgess's life certainly was a life committed to literature, what that means in, for, for us now, still. And that's a historical element for me as well, because I think Keats is one of the first English poets to pose that. The Marxist critic Christopher Cordwell said, you know, Keats was one of the first English poets to engage fully and feel on his body, feel directly what we might call the literary industry could do to somebody. Well, yeah, this is interesting to me because I think in the, this is, um, there's a moment in the Gittings biography of Keats, which is the one that most people seem to think Burgess used when writing Abba Abba. Um, but there's this moment before Keats then falls ill, where he kind of really decides not to give poetry a go, which is the big decision between poetry or medicine, but actually to make a literary career out of it, which yeah. is a different thing. Yeah. Um, so where he starts looking around and going, OK, well, if I can't make money out of poetry, what can I make money out of? And I think sometimes this is the role of sort of where Keats's death and this kind of these posthumous lives get quite interesting because Burgess's point is, his stance on Keats is pretty consistently that... Um, Keats was cut off in his prime, and this is a great loss to literature. He would have been the next Shakespeare's one argument. If he had met Belly, he might have become a kind of Cockney Robert Browning. It's yeah. kind of the, the image. He has all these sort of images. But the, his biggest kind of thing is Keats would have been the next Shakespeare. He bases this, and I'm picking up what you mentioned about the letters, also... He says the letters are what kind of uh, suggest that more than the poetry. The mm. letters suggest the kind of maturing intellect that would have come up with even greater work. Whereas um, Andrew Motion, who similarly engages with notions of biography in the, in the invention of Dr. Cake, uh, his Keats, um, uh, who doesn't die, but returns to, to um, England to live out his life anonymously as a doctor so he devotes himself again to medicine um 
he his writing doesn't get better. He doesn't become the next Shakespeare. Rather, he goes down the Wordsworth route, which yeah. is that actually, you know, his his later work becomes doesn't it's not as good as the uh, as the stuff that he wrote when he was younger, mm. um, and that's the great fear, um, yeah. which sort of which is a kind of a horrible thing of saying sort of you know well I don't I don't even want to say it, but this idea that the death then kind of preserves Keats yeah. Uh, sort of inscribes him as the young man. Um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting this idea of Keats making a decision to 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 commit himself to making a life in literature. And of course, you're absolutely right. At one point, he sort of he worries that he's not going to make it as a poet, and he, he's Otto the Great. He's going to make it in the theatre. Yeah. The theatre is the way yeah. to make money at the time, and it kind of misfires. Otto the Great is kind of unfinished and it's probably a good thing that it never was and 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 it's never p- performed um but i think keats i think the idea of compression is interesting here is that keats makes that decision to, to make his life in literature sees that it's not working for him as a poet attempts to you know write drama and become a in, 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 ostensibly a sort of man of the theater that 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 doesn't that doesn't work. And it's interesting at that point as well, the Shakespeare connection, because, you know, everybody, I teach Shakespeare here, and everybody thinks of Shakespeare, well, not everybody, but many people think Shakespeare principally as a, a playwright, but he begins as a poet. Mm. He begins, you know, with the rape of Lucretia and uh, 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 and Adonis, and and he begins as a, as a, as a poet and then, and then becomes a man of the theatre. Um, similarly Keats we have a kind of double movement we have him starting off as a poet then attempting to become a man of the theatre failing and then going back to be a poet and this is where I come back to the idea of compression everything gets compressed down to a kind of a- 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 absolute intensity where Keats almost envisages himself being a, a-, a-, a- a man of literature, ma- ma- making his living, a literary person, ma- ma- making his living as a poet, very, very rapidly sees what that implies, the various reviews and what a career in literature means, which means, you know, getting published and visit- uh, uh, speaking to editors and getting things done and one thing or another. And I think Keats sees very, very, very quickly that that that, that what it, one of the things, it's not enough to be a great poet. You have to do all these other things. I mean, there are a number of poets writing at the time. Keats is right now. We no longer remember them. And they were perfectly successful. Uh, 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 um, and there's a whole series of other things. This comes back to the Cordwell point. There's a whole series of other things that what we would, of the emerging culture industry, that it's emerging at that time, reviews, uh, you know, uh, 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 getting your name put about, uh, getting getting good quality editions circulated and so on. The commercialization of cultural life that had been going on for some time, probably, you know, since, uh, uh, but, but is reaching certain stages of what we might call social and political and cultural intensity at the time of Keats, uh, emerging industrial modernity. And I think Keats sees that very rapidly. And he thinks, yes, but that's not what a poet is. And I think at that point, if you look at the poets and you look at the writers who Keats is fascinated by and wants to, in a sense, not imitate, that's not the right word, but be as one with, it's Spencer, it's Shakespeare, Milton to a certain degree, uh, there are others, Dante's mentioned, Chaucer's mentioned, and what's interesting is you get a kind of intertextual kind of coming into existence of a certain kind of Keatsian poetic identity. If you look at a number of the poets, uh, there's one uh, there's one poem uh, written on a spare page in Chaucer's uh, and uh, or on first reading Dante's uh, Cavalcanti Farinata section so, um, or, or or on Spencer. So at every moment, right from from a certain point onwards, Keats is inscribed into a kind of poetic history, veering away from the contemporary cultural cultural literary situation in which he finds himself. In that sense, he's already beyond or below or outside what we might call, or at the edge of, or moving beyond what we call the culture industry. And I think as a writer, as a writer, Burgess recognises that, that the, 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 the role of the writer in the modern world is part of the culture industry, but it's not just that. To be a writer, to, there is this other question about what, 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 a life in, what a life dedicated to literature 
would mean and still means for us as human beings, you know. And it's not just circumscribed by the culture industry, to which at every moment the writer has to engage with, the TV interviews, the prizes, yeah, and all the rest of it. But but that's that's not what literature is. You know, Beckett uh, said in, in, actually in an interview, I think, somewhere said, well, at a certain point, I decided to gamble my existence on literature. It's a wonderful phrase, <laughs> that I gambled my existence, my whole existence on literature. Um, and I think Burgess is aware of that question. Uh, that question still, I think it's still, it's still, still pertinent. Uh, I think it's still pertinent to us. It's not gone away. It's the question that keeps poses to us. It's there in the great beauty and the power uh, of the of the of the poetry, which utterly, which in terms of this day and age is is utterly could be just utterly irrelevant to us. We don't really need it, but we couldn't live without it. So it's a. It's a need that's not really a need, in a way. Again, it's deep, 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 deeply complex and paradoxical. A kind of haunting question. As a kind of final point, I wanted to talk a bit about how we relate Keats to other writers. He's kind of put in a group, most typically, well, directly with Lee Hunt, yep. but then Shelley as well, and Byron in that kind of thing. I mean, they never met, but there's that sort of ambivalent relationship between them with... Byron sort of making his comment about Keats being snuffed out um, by a bad review, but then taking it back. Interestingly, Burgess picks up on that Byron point and sort of jumps to his defence when um, Burgess writes a, a kind of English literature textbook for Italian students. And in that, he ends up, he, make, he has an entry on Keats and he talks about him saying, this mind was not snuffed out. Yeah. He talks about a kind of, um, he talks about people, uh, old kind of mediocre sort of uh, hacks while this sort of uh, young poet died at the height of his talent. That's his kind of uh, big point. And actually he sort of feels like that what you have, he sort of ameliorates his position on Keats being a sort of, um, sort of uh, failed potential, but to actually saying, well, what we have got is actually very, very, very good. Yeah. Um, which I think is interesting. The key texts which occur in Abba Abba are um, Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy. That is a kind of quite important text in there. And then, of course, there's this big fictional meeting between Keats and Belly, who are very different. But that again then turns into this conversation about potential. If Keats had met Belly, what could Keats have become? And actually, effectively, Burgess in this book i don't know i read this this morning it's quite interesting because this brings us back to the uh to the spirit of keats and this kind of recurring spirit is that belly's at uh belly is at keats's funeral and there is a, a dismissive priest on hand who says well he's an atheist and an englishman and you know we all know where he's going and belly gets incredibly angry um uh, and he calls the he calls the priest a bloated parasite, and then turns to his friend and says, <laughs> "God forgive me, what gets into me?" But it's right there on the Spanish step where Burgess too was kind of has these visitations by the angry spirit of Keats. Yeah. So it's almost like Keats is possessing Belly, and then uh, uh, his sort of rage and, and things sort of get him to write his thousands and thousands of sonnets. Um, in some ways, they couldn't be more different. Um, but uh, yeah, I was wondering who sort of. Um, are there any particular ratios? So Burgess uses this this meeting, which might have happened. I mean, it works in terms of dates, but there's mm. no proof for it. No. Um, but I don't think that matters. What happens is that he's interested in, um, I think, what that contact says about, or or might kind of tell us about the two of them, both Belly and Keats. Um, and I was wondering, are there any other sort of writers who you mentioned, Holinian, for instance, who you would relate Keats to, to kind of in a sort of reconstellation, I guess is what's going yeah, on. Yeah, I think that phrase reconstellation is is is, is what I'm working with, and the idea of uh, of constellation, because of course a constellation has no centre; it's uh, uh, every star or every uh, 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 every every planet in the constellation is related to another one as a centre and as and, and not as a centre. And I think again, you're right, and I think in in the way you characterise it, in the way you give it, Burgess is probably right. What interests me and intrigues me about Keats is number one the willful it seems to me the willful misunderstanding of keats that we've willfully the literary industry 
has and the culture industry has has willfully misunderstood Keats and in, and in that willful misunderstanding in which there is a truth unless it wouldn't have happened there is, a, there is a kind of cultural truth in it that that's we've got the kind of Keats that we need or at least on the surface but there is this other Keats and and what that willful misunderstanding does in order to come into being it has to suppress all these other elements of Keats the true for for me the true poetic power and significant significance of Keats which attaches him to and allows him to be attached to a whole series of other writers who 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 operate or exist or whose names and work exist in a similar kind of situation uh, both inside and outside what we'd call the kind of literary cultural industry uh, uh, poets who don't who do not fit easily and smoothly into any series of categorizations poets uh, and to a certain degree maybe even a couple of prose writers whose power and significance uh, 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 gives them a kind of posthumous presence to which other writers presumably who are committed to absolutely to literature like Burgess give them a, a significance and influence and uh, magnetism to other living writers. So these are writers, princip principally but not exclusively poets, who are engaged with the great power of literary and poetic language in its relationship to to being, to ontology, and to not being death and mortality, and they go past and present. So. Uh, Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, uh, the traditions of the Ars Moriendi, the great writings on death that Keats would 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 have known, and we we know in fact did 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 know of Thomas Brown's urn burial and so on and so forth, uh, uh, and ones I've already mentioned, uh, Spencer, Shakespeare, Chaucer, Dante, and then there's a series of other writers, other poets, who I see Keats being attached to in fundamentally posing the question of what poetry means and is for us now and that question has still not gone away and therefore because that question posed by those great poets those powerful poets hasn't gone away we can't classify them historically as being romantic or neoclassical or uh, victorian or 19th century or 20th century or modernist or whatever and these writers who i see keats attached to are holderlin rilke Salan, Emily Dickinson, Lorca, Mallarmé, Rambeau, uh, 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 and there are other, and, and there are and there are uh, there are others. Um, but that that kind of constellation, I think you'll see of those writers of great power, uh, Borges, Kafka, yeah, who pose this great question of why literature still matters, what it is to exist in a literary universe. Uh, 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 Keats is attached, in my, in my view, to those writers. Uh, still, I can't make any historical argument out for that. I can't make any textual argument out for that. You know, uh, in in many ways, it's purely an act of it's an act it's an act of willful intellect and willful imagination to to connect Keats to those writers. But I think you're right when you say Burgess. You know, there's no real evidence that, that Keats ever met Belly, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We've got the book. We've got Abba Abba. That's what matters. Does it really matter if Keats met Billy? I don't. I don't think it does. No, but we then sort of think about him in those terms. I think what happens for me particularly is uh, several biographers kind of sort of draw on this point that Keats comes to Rome and the great one. Another great tragedy. It's always Keats is kind of sort of denied these possibilities. Is that he he doesn't actually ever get to see Rome? I think mm. from what I remember is the Piazza di Spagna is kind of on the northern edge of the. It's it not is. even in the city properly. His health doesn't allow him to go much beyond the local neighbourhood. Um, so he reads a bit of Italian um, sort of literature here and there, but not much. Um, so he has this kind of. Um, but whereas the encounter with Belly opens Keats up to a kind of, you know, imagine sort of. Keats International, rather than sort of English romantic poet, but yeah. actually Keats is kind of um, sort of having a much broader scope. And actually, what your list, sort of that constellation you described is massively uh, sort of international or transnational yeah. in its kind of uh, 
relations, which is very interesting to think about. I mean, I mean it, what's interesting, of course, as well, is, I mean, there are, there are no historical, geographical or biographical justifications for the kind, of, the kind of list I gave, but there are textual ones, at least for the, for the earlier writers. If you look at what Keats does with Chaucer, Dante, Milton, Spencer in particular, and Shakespeare, he incorporates them into his poetry as living poetic, Voices, not not vo pe uh, kind of living poetic language, and so therefore historical time is diminished to point zero. They're still there; they're only there textually. They're only there poetically, in the way that Keats is with us now poetically. He ha he has that, in a sense, posthumous posthumous existence. He has come into being as in a kind of poetic existence. It is there for us because the question of what Keats means. And what uh, 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 and what his significance is, significance is is still with us. And I think, you know, that idea of a constellation of of writers, uh, 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 in which which are for whom the questions they pose are not yet in any way answered or even approached. I think that's part of the reason I'm working on. I'm doing the work I'm doing is in the in the Anglo-American tradition. Many of these these questions and concepts that I'm I'm raising are in a sense considered too philosophical for literary criticism. Ontology, existence, mortality. Uh, I mean, deconstruction. The traditions of deconstruction have posed the question of the relationship between you know being and poetic language and so on. We've got we've got the appropriation of the work of Derrida and Levinas and Blanchot, but they've not really been applied, especially not to. English Romantic writers, um, and so we may not yet even have approached a way to pose that question yet. It's not a matter of answering the question of what Keats poses to us. We don't. We haven't even approached or appropriated the language to be even to even pose the question correctly or in a plausible way. Yeah, I think that question has been posed about Holderlin. That question has been posed about Rilke. It's been it's posed in that kind of high hermeneutic and philosophical tradition on the continent. It's been posed about Mallarmé, you know, Paul de Man writing about Mallarmé, uh, 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 Yeats writing later about his, you know, Mallarmé and what was the significance of Mallarmé. So there are writers who appeal, it, it seems to me, to other writers. Obviously, something about Keats, as you say, appear appealed to Burgess, and it's very difficult to put your finger on why. We need to be able to. We need a language. We need a lexicon, a critical lexicon, for to be able to pose that question. Of uh, uh, and that's what I'm. That's what I'm aiming for. That's what the work is trying to do. I think that's right. I think. Um, I, I think the idea of the posthumous posthumous existence of Keats is quite key, but also then the way in which this question seems to me again and again seems to be about. Uh, opening up Keats to a broader influences um, and other vocabularies. And so perhaps it's not a coincidence that Abba Abba is about Keats, it's also about belly, but it's also about translation mm -hmm. and finding other kind of palettes of words and other uh, kind of lexicons and things to use. Quite central to the book is, for instance, an Italian English dictionary which Keats finds, yeah. which creates in him the epiphany that. He realizes how uh, it's an Italian English dictionary that Keats, that Shakespeare would have used, and it creates in Keats' mind a sudden. He has this sudden vision of, of how Shakespeare would have spoken, and it's not yeah. how he would have imagined it. But also the fact that Shakespeare was closer to these other countries than 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 Keats is yeah. at the time. So there's this sense in Keats of kind of suddenly having this vision of of kind of what um, of of what. Uh, uh, of, well, in this case, of what Rome might offer him, yeah. but then doesn't. <laughs> and then doesn't. He just doesn't live long enough to see it. He's not healthy enough. He's not healthy enough to see it. I, I, I think that's right. I think there is there, there is a, a a kind of series of connections, poetic connections, poetic vistas, if you like, in in, in Keats's poetic language, that 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 goes far beyond far beyond the narrow confines of straightforward periodization and standard kind of historicist uh, versions uh, of Keats uh, in the kind of continental 
line, that I'm, that continental line of criticism that, I, that I'm working with, there's a, there's a reasonably famous phrase from Theodore Adorno about philosophy, about why philosophy still exists. Mm -hmm. And he says the reason the philosophical discourse, philosophical books, philosophy itself still exists as an academic subject and as, and as a discourse, as a way of questioning, is because the chance of its realisation was missed. In other words, because we don't have the philosophical life, we have philosophy instead. If we had, if we had the realisation of philosophy, we would be living a philosophical life. We wouldn't need philosophy as a, as a subject because we would have become its object. We would have become, we would have a philosophical life. And, I, and again, I'm trying to do the same with Keats. I'm trying to say, I guess, which is one of the things this, this, this talk's kind of brought out, I think it's clarified it in my own mind, is we could say the same about poetry and certainly we can say the same about Keats. The reason we are still interested in Keats, the reason Keats still haunts us is because the possibility of a poetic existence has been missed. We've let it slip.